Hello and welcome to the third ever episode of the Left Wing Back Podcast with me, Kevin Regan. We are, of course, continuing with our first ever series of My Time in the Gansey, the show where we look back at the life and times of eight former Carlo footballers and hurlers, and of course, taking a different club each week. Before we get started with today's episode, I'd just like to mention a couple of things. Firstly, a huge thank you to all who have subscribed and listened in in huge numbers so far. It took us to 16th overall in the whole of Ireland in last week's charts. It was very much appreciated and meant a lot on a personal level as well. Secondly, I'd just like to thank the outgoing Carlo Senior Football Manager, Turlock O'Brien, who on Saturday stepped down as manager bringing the county some wonderful days in the process we are hoping to speak to Thurlow for a special edition of the Left Wing Back podcast a little later on this week so keep an eye out for that this particular episode and the other five episodes to come were all recorded before Thurlow stepped down so just be mindful of that as there are a couple of mentions in the episodes to come from when he was in charge so let's get on to business today's episode is brought to you in association with the Back in Line Clinic Today's guest comes from Clevelyn Clinical GA Club, where the Back in Line Clinic is situated. He's also the owner of the clinic, and he's going to delve into some of the bizarre times of being a Carlo footballer in the noughties. We talk about piss ups the night before Allianz League games, controversial departures of county managers, swapping county football for county hurling, albeit in a different role, and the ongoing pursuit of trying to get the club back to the top tier of Carlo football. Today's guest is Mr. Paul Kelly. We do hope you enjoy. Very welcome on the Left Wing Back podcast. Um, I suppose it's good to talk to you for a change when I'm actually not on your physio's bed in agony. It's great. It's great to hear from you when you're in good order as well. So it is. It's nice to see you on the other on the other end of it, not on my table and in good form. Yeah, what's well, rare is wonderful, I suppose. P. Um, listen, come here. The first thing I suppose that I'd ask you is, you know, why football and not hurling? Wexford would have been in their pomp with all Ireland's and hurling when you were growing up down there in Kildavan. So, what was the gravitation towards football? Who got to kind of focus on that more so? Yeah, well, mostly our options when we were younger were um, it was Gaelic football. There was a little bit of hurling, and not as much as we would have liked, I suppose, being a Wexford border county, but uh, mostly Gaelic football. But um, small though hurling, as I said, yeah, we, we tend to gravitate towards the football down this end. And um, I suppose between my father and my uncle Aidan Kelly, who would have trained uh, our teams the whole way up along, um, they probably really introduced us into GA and the Gaelic football predominantly when I was, say, five, six years of age. At that time, when I was around, say, five, six, seven, very impressionable at the time, we would have um, been stronger, probably a senior football team and an intermediate hurling team. And um, a lot of the guys, they used, we used to win the intermediate hurling and they go and then they used to get kind of well bet by the senior teams back down again, relegated. And it was kind of yo-yoing up and down between intermediate and kind of getting well bet and senior back to winning intermediate. And I think lads... A uh, point there in the air around 2000s just decided would we just concentrate on the football and see can we get over the line from maybe getting the semi finals and the odd final and getting bet to see maybe concentrate on the football. And early 2000s was really when that probably really made the decision to concentrate on the football. Right, so you obviously played underage football with Carol the Hoy up along then as well? Played with the minors, played under 16 minor and under 21 before we were brought into the senior team but um i suppose a couple of the bigger games i'd remember um mixer condon was actually managing the team in 2003 i think it was and we got to the leinster quarter final and we came up against a a fairly strong mead unit that were favorites for leinster and um we had quite a strong team the likes of thomas walsh willie power john kill very strong team up to the middle uh simon ray you know, and um, a lot of lads that turned out to be some of the best footballers for Carlo. But at that time, um, we, we, we faced Mead in the quarterfinal, and Mead had the likes of Joe Sheridan, Brian Farrell. I'm nearly sure Rory Stories was playing midfield that day as well, actually, but I'm not 100%. Don't quote me on that one. But, um, but we were actually beating Mead up until the last kick of the game, and uh, the corner forward from Mead got a goal last, literally the last kick of the game, and the best by a pint in the end. Um, so it was, uh, we're very close. That, that's probably one of the, the biggest memories for me, even though we lost. It was probably the closest we came to beating a, a traditionally strong county in football at the time, you know? So I think you actually went on to the senior panel then the same year, is that right? Yes. It was actually the same year, 2003, that winter. 
um, Mixer Condon was the manager of, of the under 21 and the senior. And um, he brought a couple of us up from the under 21 team um, into the senior mix just to train with the senior team, first of all, in 2003. And then 2004, then we were actually in on, in on the Burn Cup panel. And we got was a couple of big games in that, actually, because we beat the, a very strong Dublin team, actually, in 2004 in the Burn Cup. And uh, pushed on for to a, an OK league from there. Unfortunately, then something happened during the league, which led to the dismissal of Mixer Condon. Uh, I think it was a four league game, perhaps in Donegal. Maybe you shed some light on that one for us. Um, yeah, we were. It was actually the last game of the league, and we were up in Donegal. We stayed in Bundorn, um in Brian McAniff's hotel, and he actually happened to be managing Donegal at the time. But um, we went up and I think we were mid-table or towards the bottom end of the table. We couldn't be relegated or we couldn't um, you know, be promoted. So, so the night before the match, um, I remember Mixer just said to us, lads, if you want to have a pint there, you're after working hard there from before Christmas, had a couple of good results. And if you want to have a pint or two before the match or the night, the night we arrived up in Bundorn, um, you can have a point or two, but leave it at that, at that you know. Right. So um, <laughs> I kind of, so ah, sure, a few lads, a few lads didn't drink, and a few lads did drink, and we had a few pints, and maybe some of us stayed out a little bit longer than we should have, you know. And I don't think that was Mixer's idea, really. And a few of us stayed out a bit longer than we should have, and sure it was it was Brian McAniff's hotel in Bundoran, and he had the residence bar open, and sure one thing led to another, but. The next day was a disaster, anyway, for for uh, for Carlo. That the next day, um, I, I remember like the Donegal crowd were actually laughing at some of, some of our mistakes, and just no one was on the ball. And Donegal had a strong team at the time. I think it was Division Two A at the time, and um, Donegal were pushing for promotion, and they were pretty serious. And we just weren't there on the day, and we, uh, I suppose, the media the media got a hold of it, and. Um, it didn't shine a very nice light on, on our team at the time. Okay, so a few Roby heads to follow more and then no doubt. How long did it take Mixer to react and what was that reaction like? Yeah, I think the next day it was... It would have been now that a lot, a lot of players didn't drink. It was just maybe maybe five or six lads that just had one or two and then just got a little bit giddy and you know, just ran, time ran away with us a little bit. But um, I think he knew... I'm sure he knew the next morning by the heads on a few lads as a few roping looking bios and it's it's really a time when you want to be at your very best and your freshest and and we were probably the furthest move from that as you can possibly be. So um I remember actually being at the dugout. I was a sub that day and um I remember being at the dugout and just <laughs> I think it was the first first and only day in my life that I was hoping I wouldn't be brought on. So <laughs> every time every time Mick looked towards the the dugout I, I would drop my head. <laughs> So I take it you were one of those five or six involved then? Ah, I had a couple, yeah. I was a young, impressionable man. <laughs> right, so um, what was ultimately the ins and outs of him getting the boot then? Did he resign or was he forced out? What what kind of happened after the incident? Yeah, it was, it was kind of a mix of, of a couple of things. On the Tuesday night, I remember we went down training and um, again, sure, I was only 19 at the time and I wasn't really too tuned into player power or like different things like that or meet player meetings or stuff. So I was just going in with my gear, ready to train again. And um, I remember getting togged out in the dressing room and uh, one of the elder statesmen of the team came in. I won't name him, but um, he was a legend. He, he is a legend in the county, jewel, a jewel legend. But he said to me, Kelly, what are you doing getting togged out there now? Um, throw back on your runners there and sit down there like a good boy. So, um, so I, I, I listened to the, you know, he was a much more experienced man than myself. And so I, I got tugged back in again and I sat in the dressing room with the rest of the players and we just sat there. Um, but, uh, Mixer, I think was out marking out the pitch at the time for training. So it seemed like he was going to go ahead with a normal training session, but, uh, nobody seemed to be coming out to warm up or no one seems to be coming out to do a bit of kicking before training. And, um, he came in. Came into training about 10 minutes after the supposed start and he just stuck his head in the door and I think he kind of knew and the players kind of knew and he, he just said, 
best of luck to you for the rest of the year, lads. I'm stepping down. Thanks for your efforts. So, so it was kind of a resignation then. I was on both sides, really. Was there kind of like, um, I won't say an agenda, but was there kind of a revolt led by some of the more experienced players then to have them removed that or kind of what went on? Um, I don't... I don't, I don't think so. I think it was a, a couple of the older players who had more sense than to drink. And um, I think I think a lot of them just said this shouldn't be going on at this level and the players need to cut themselves on and, and what happened with management, maybe that shouldn't happen, shouldn't have happened at that level and we need to we need to move on from this and change things up a bit, you know. I think that was basically it. Now, there was, there was no one in particular comes to mind. It was just those the, the more experienced lads who have We've seen it all before. Said enough of this now. Championships coming up. Enough of this. Let's change things up. That's 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 really all my memory of that. To tell you the truth. So then Luke Dempsey comes in and you have a big win over Longford in the championship. How quickly was that turnaround between Mixer going and Luke coming in? Yeah, I remember Luke coming in and I'd often heard of Luke, but um, I'd never trained under him before. But um, he came in and he was a real breath of fresh air that year. I remember being. Very impressed with his training sessions. They were so lively and um, everybody was in good order. Lots of football. And I remember the weather being particularly good as well when we were out training. So he came in pretty quick after the league. And um, he only had, he didn't have long, I'd say three or four weeks to get us going. And we ended up beating a strong Longford team now. That, that year, we were a very strong Longford team. I think we scored 4-15, 116 maybe. Yeah. Um, we had a serious forward unit at that time. Uh, I think, I think... Compared to now, maybe we're a more defensive, uh, maybe a more defensive built county team. But that time, we had six, seven, eight absolute top class forwards um, who could score from anywhere, score from play, score from threes. And um, it was just just options all over the field, you know. So that was a fantastic win against Longford. Luke just got everyone primed and ready for championship just at the right time. And everyone was buzzing at the right time. But it was one of the greatest days that I ever had uh, as a Carlo player. After that, then you played Leash and Netwatch Cullen Park, who were, of course, the Rain Leinster champions. And I think they won 15 points to 1 7 in the end. Quite a close game, actually, for the most part. Um, I just remember going to that game as a kid, and the crowds in Netwatch Cullen Park was just unbelievable. Oh, that was, that, I'd say that's the biggest crowd I've ever seen in Dr. Cullen myself. Um, lovely summer's day again. Half the team was only over the, over the bridge there, like between Arliss and Greg and them lads. And, um, the likes of the likes of Bino McDonald on top of his game and um, Munley and all these lads. So that was, that was a massive occasion in, in Carlo that day. And, and I think um, I, I think Carlo actually played very well there that day. Uh, Leash had a phenomenal team after winning All-Ireland's minor in under-21. Yeah, I actually remember Brian Kelly's goal in the first half and you're thinking just maybe there's an upset on the cards, but unfortunately it wasn't to be. Um, the year after that then, Liam Hayes came in. Now, I watched an interview he did with Shane Stapleton on OurGame.ie and he came across as a very interesting character. What was it like to play under? Yes, I, I actually remember um, when the panel, the panel was informed of they're, they're in, unveiling a, a big name that's coming to manage the senior football team. I remember that day actually when we were told we were to come into a meeting in the Seven Oaks and um, the, the big name was going to be unveiled. And I had often watched Mead as a young lad. I used to love watching Mead, McEntee and Hayes and do you know those those days when the three the three replays against Dublin and geez, I, I I loved watching uh, Mead as a young lad. But um, I remember he came into the room and I actually didn't recognise him originally. Like so, I was there. Who is this now? And what's all the commotion about? Um, very big man. I remember hugely huge stature. Very intimidating. Um, and basically, when someone told me who he was, I was very excited for the season to come ahead. Like, um, what a fantastic footballer! As you said, he, he might have had a huge track record with with county inter county management, but um, what what a legend to be able to bring back down to his own roots and try and manage our senior football team. So when Hayes comes in, then he tries to change everything, jersey colour included. Um, he seemed like a very forward thinking man. Um, can you give some insight maybe into some of those examples that you would have saw playing under him as well? Yes, um, he, he was a very forward-thinking kind of a manager. Um, I think that was 2005. And he was trying to implement a lot of things that county teams are probably only putting in in the last couple of years there now at the moment, you know. So uh, trying to get the best nutritionists. I remember he had Carl Gilligan down 
who is um, a very a very sought after strength and conditioning specialist with the Irish Rugby IRFU. Um, so you had him down for the first two months, but he was pulled away by the IRFU for a conflict of interest. Um, he wanted to bring us to La Manga on a training camp. So you'd see, like you'd hear of the English soccer teams and all the top teams in the world going to La Manga, but he, was, he, he had set the wheels in motion for that. But um, I think the finances just weren't there at the time. And his big ideas, I, I, he just couldn't get the financial backing. So we ended up going to Luke and then for a, for a week, <laughs> Luke and House Hotel for a weekend instead of La Manga, but still very good. Like. <laughs> Slightly less exotic. Um, you had a good run in the side at that stage. Um, before Whiskey won the championship, I, I know there was a couple of notable league wins. Yeah, Monaghan. I think Monaghan was my first game at Roscommon. Um, we beat Monaghan, actually, in Dr. Cullen Park. That was under Liam Hayes. Um, we beat Clare that year. I played wing back that day. Um, we, we, I'm not sure about Roscommon. We won three games in the league that year. We bet London as well. Um, no, actually, London beat us, actually, in Dr. Cullen by a pint. But we actually won three games apart from that. So we were up mid-table with Hayes that time. We are going okay in the league. Yeah, I can actually remember the game against Fermanagh, who many people will remember were in the All Ireland semi final year before, were beat by Mayo after a replay. Um, but moving on to the championship, then, obviously it was a mammoth occasion when Carlo were to take on Wexford in Crow Park. You obviously being down at the Wexford border, that was massive for you at the time. Yeah, we're buzzing with that. I, I actually worked in Bunclody at the time in the in the gym in the mill race in Bunclody, and um, I remember there was a great old crack around with all the all the Bunclody heads, all the GA, Wexford GA heads, and they knew that I was going to be playing like against it. So they, they ended up getting the bus actually up from work. for It was half Carlo, half Wexford crowd. Great crack. But um, I remember the build-up to it myself. It's the only time I ever played in Crow Park. And um, I remember just in the dressing rooms, so it's just a different buzz out here. It's very hard to describe the energy. It's like just waiting to explode. Everybody is just waiting, pent-up energy. like And um, it was... Probably, probably one of the days I, I'd say I'll never forget that day. It was probably the most memorable day I ever had. Uh, we again we lost, but that was a top class Wexford side. That was that was the Wexford side that were pushing to win Leinster at the time. Um, they had Matty Ford, Colin Morris, Philip Wallace, Eric Bradley, you name it. Though. That John John Hegarty, Red Barry. Um, so the, the Wexford team was very very strong. And we literally came within a, a whisker. We, I think we should have won that game. Simon Ray scored a penalty and we were up by a couple of pints. Um, and a few minutes to go and Matty Ford kicked two screamers of pints from out around the sidelines and out around the end line. And they beat us by, I think it was a pint in the end. But um, I remember actually in the second half, Dublin were playing Mead after our match. And there was about 66,000 at the second half of the match. And that's the end of all there to see Carlo. But... They were all shouting on Carlo in the second half because we were the underdog. And that was, I'd say, the biggest buzz, the biggest rush I've ever had on the football field in my life. I think a good thing was I wasn't starting because I would have been, I, I would have been very nervous, I'd imagine, for a few days before. Um, so the fact I wasn't starting, I didn't care. I was going up and I was soaking it all in. And I remember kicking around before the match and we were shooting from nearly the middle of the field and the balls going over the bar from all angles. But... I had no nerves at all. And then it was just too, I wasn't expecting to be coming on so soon. So it was just like, you're coming on, bang. Didn't have a time to get nervous, you know. So straight in, I think I was Mark and Red Barry that day. So we lost to Wexford and then we moved on and played Offaly, I think. That, that was an epic, yeah, that, that, that day beaten a, a very strong Offaly side as well. Some very big names on that Offaly team there. And um, I remember... I remember the crowd after the game were just jogging over and back, cooling down, and the, the whole stand was just of people shouting and roaring and singing, following me up to Carlo, and it was just great. But we were just on fire at the time, you know. And um, but, but what a way to win the game, though, from one of Carlo's best forwards ever, not just the last 10 years or 20. I, I'm sure there hasn't been too many better than Mark Happener in the last in the last 100 years in Carlo. We were down two or three of our best players against Limerick, and um, we just... We, didn't, we just didn't turn up on the day then, and uh, unfortunately, it was live on television, and it probably took RT uh, a couple of years to get over and come back down to us again and show us live after a, a fairly poor showing, a bad end to the year. I, I think the two, two boys, Willie Power and, and Tom Walsh, two men, probably six foot four, in and around, good footballers, 
uh, and leaders to have the two of them gone out of the team was just a massive hole ripped into into our side and um I suppose we just didn't we never got over that I think and Limerick played well on the day as well Limerick were playing so he had a massive influence on the first year and and um I just remember he was getting a little bit upset with even gear and things like that you know he he, he felt our gear was inferior and he there was a lot of little things that I, I think his, his heart was maybe going out of the job a little bit. He, he probably felt like he couldn't get done what he envisaged getting done and how he could change the county, you know. So um, on the second year, I was only in for a couple of months and I had to get an operation on a grind. So I mightn't be the best man to talk about 2006 because um, I, I then went to university over in England. So um, I was only in for the first couple of months, really. And you could see he was... He, he wanted more and he wanted kind of more access to finances and he wanted better strength and condition and he wanted, he wanted to improve everything really. And he, he probably just didn't have it in his power with the county he was in. Possibly in a bigger county with more finances and all, he would have he made a big name for himself on the inter-county management scene. He also went on record and said that when players left the field, he felt his work was being undone. And that he would have to spend somewhere up to 60 hours a week with the players in order to see real change. What do you think he exactly meant when he said that? I think in general that time anyway, if you look at the stature and the physique of footballers, um, we, we were probably built at inter-county level. We were probably built like intermediate club are now, you know, and, and the amount of work you do off the field. At that time, we were training Tuesday. You train hard Tuesday, train hard Friday and either a match or a training session on Sunday. So it's kind of like what a club team would be at now, or even less than what a club team would be at now. Uh, There was a little bit of gym work, but he wanted more. Um, He was trying to introduce a lot of things, but we probably done six weeks gym work uh, at the start of the year. But we we know now that's a waste of time. If you're not continuing, just keeping the maintenance of your strength and power work up, that's a waste of time now. uh, And he knew that as well. Um, so I, I think I, I think um, he's probably talking about the effort of, of lads off the field and it's hard to comment on that actually because um, I think it was a different time than it is now. Now you see a lot of players uh, don't drink, they, they go to the gym every day, they, they do mobility sessions, they go recovery sessions. I think it's a totally different game now and, and maybe when Liam was talking about that in the interview, Maybe he's thinking more of now the way players look after themselves rather than 2005, 2006. Obviously, at that particular point, Paul, lads were still fond of a few drinks. Maybe not to the same extent as they would have been a couple of years before Hayes came along. But do you think at all that it may be a possibility that certain clubs would have said to their players, look, you're not nothing in there with the county, come on and train with us instead and we'll win a championship? I'm not saying that was the case, but do you think that's a possibility perhaps yeah that's that's a strong possibility really and uh, it's rife it still is it's rife all around the country i think in smaller more rural clubs who if they're missing their best player or two they're going to struggle in the league they mightn't have the numbers uh so they they have to think of themselves you know and they have to keep they have to keep pushing their own club forward and it is quite hard the way the county is set up to, to be able to really give your best to a club and the county at the same time. So, yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised um, if clubs were kind of pulling against Liam at that time and maybe saying, look, you're not going to win in All-Ireland with Carlo coming back out and we'll win the senior championship with the club. So that's a, a very strong possibility. Yeah, and I've often heard managers in my time in clubs I've worked with or clubs I've played with, um, managers saying, look, what are you going to win? Why are you, what are you going into that county team for? Why are you giving up your time for that? Come back to us. This is where you're born and raised. We look after you from an early age and we'll still look after you. So um, I, I had huge respect for Liam. I really liked him as a person and very decent man, very honest man, um, kind of intimidating to talk to, but a very nice man. Um, and I just kind of put my finger on why we didn't maybe go a little bit further or, or maybe get closer to it, even a Leinster final, you know. Was that the end for you then as a county footballer or did you ever go back in at any stage? Because I know you had to balance your studies too. Yeah, um, I went to university in, in Manchester for four years. And when I came back then, it was 2010. or I was back in 2009. And Luke Dempsey actually called me back in in 2010. Um, 
and I was trying to start up a business at the time, starting up the, the back in line clinic, and I was trying to get work with teams in order to get started out. So um, I got called in, and I was, I said to Luke, it's going to be quite hard now because my job is going to be working evenings, and it's going to be quite hard to to commit. But sure, we'll give it a try. And um, I played a match against Manus University, and we played against Carlo IT actually. That was the last game I played then in 2010. Played Carlo IT. And I, I remember actually, um, I, I done a late tackle on it. I think it was Jerry Seaver, a Dublin footballer, was playing for Carlo IT at the time. And um, I took him out of it. I didn't mean to, but I took him out of it in front of the stand in Carlo IT. And the crowd went wrong. There, were, there was a good crowd at the match, and there were, I was getting awful abuse. And Mark Carpenter was the manager of Carlo IT at the time. And he was giving me awful abuse altogether. And uh, I remember I felt bad now, and I, I, I didn't mean to do what I'd done, but um, about four days later, I was doing the physio for the Carlo IT Sigerson team, and sure, who came in for a rub on a receiver? And I could see him double he kind of, he, he kind of, he, he double talk, he kind of, fr- kind of frowned, a bemused frown looked at me, and he, he just lay down on the bed, and I said, yeah, you're right, and, and I apologized. And he just laughed. He said, ah, what happens on the GA field stays in the GA field. So, <laughs> but yeah, that was the point where I was like, it's going to be very hard to make sport with, with or playing with the county team with setting up my own business. So I just had to call it a day then with the county team. I'm going to come back to your club stuff, which I'm not forgetting for a second. But uh, you've been the physio for the Carlos Senior Hurlers for, I suppose, the best part of a decade. Is that the closest thing you'll get to actually playing county yourself while not having to worry about the responsibilities of, of being an intercounty player, of course. Yes, oh, totally. Yeah, um, it's a it's a dream, a dream part of the job, really. Um, being in, I've been in with the hurlers now for five or five years, I think it is now, and and um, just the whole setup. I I would have normally went to every hurling game anyway with the county, so getting to go to the matches, so you're getting paid to go to the matches. Actually, um, you're having the crack with the lads. The lads are a great bunch of lads. Uh, it was or Five clubs, maybe maybe six at push, but four or five clubs make up most of the team. And um, big rivals, big club rivals off the field, but um, when it comes to playing with the county, they all they all rowing together and they're all the best of friends. I think most of them are related up there, now, so. Yeah, and of course, you can have your few guilt-free points this way also. Yes, yeah, there's no pressure that way, so as long as I can sprint, make a couple of sprints out of a few injured players get a good bit of recovery in between that then and go again. I, I, I should be okay. So I think I can uh, have a few pints then after the match. Or I generally wouldn't before the, the night before a match, though. We, we want to keep a fresh head, especially at that level. It's it's quite intense, actually, on the sideline, um, especially when they're playing the likes of Kilkenny or Wexford and Senior Ch- Leinster Championships, and you want to really have a fresh head on you. So, yeah, I'd be probably as strict as some of the players before matches, like, yeah, and of course, you were our physiotherapist for the Carl Minor Hurlers in 2009 also. Was that possibly one of the first county teams you would have worked with? Yeah, I think it was. Um, it, it kind of suited to work with the Hurlers because I was playing football and sure, you could be running into anybody or you could be uh, having little spades or little rows with lads. And, and it was good. Like the, the hurler, A lot of the Hurlers I wouldn't be coming across as often. So um, I think the county minor team... Was one of, was the first. I actually worked with the Wexford minor football team the year before, and and a little bit with Michael Davids, as you know yourself, under sixteen with Johnny Nevin. Um, I remember yourself and Huey Gann and a couple of lads like that, a couple of great footballers there and hurlers there. Um, and then I worked worked my way into the county team, so worked up from minor, under twenty one, and then uh, Pat English brought me into the senior, so I was in with Pat for two years, and then three years with Colin Bonner then. Yeah, and doing a damn good job as well. Fair play. Um, let's revert back then to what probably are the glory days of the club career with Calvin Tony Gall. And, of course, you got to a county final in 2006 against Palatine. We'll come to that in a few moments. But the start of when you were in your pomp, I take it, is 2003. And I remember you playing a senior semi-final against Old Auckland. Um, is that probably when you started to make that breakthrough? Yes, I think I think it was at the time. I, I remember that game actually. Um, went to a replay with Old Auckland. Uh, I was marking Johnny Nevin at the time. Um, Johnny was some mover, and he, even at the time he was getting a bit older, but he was a tough man to handle. But I think we were unfortunate that the likes of Old Auckland were going so well as well at the time. 
a small rural club like ourselves, I know Lachlan had a fierce, strong team. Um, their ogre quite strong. Rafili were always, Rafili always seems to be the team that we really struggled with as well. Um, very strong club team there, all through the noughties there. So, um, but we were coming good. That, that under 16 and minor team was, they were all coming to the age of about 22, 23, and they were making up the backbone of that team, uh, sprinkled in with a couple of more experienced players. So, yeah, it was probably our, our most, without winning anything, we, it was probably our most fruitful time and it was the closest we were getting to winning anything for Calavan since maybe back in the 70s, you know, at senior level. Before we actually get to the 06 final, um, just recall something. What's this I hear about you missing a free in an underage final? Uh, first of all, I never even had you down as a forward, let alone a free taker. Yeah, um, I, I used to play most of my football in, in midfield underage and um, I used to take the freeze for Calavan. I, I was picked ahead of Noel Conway because Noel, Noel had a habit of laying you down on, on a big day, you know, when the when the going got tough. That one. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I, 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 I tried to forget about that free that I missed against Airog. That was a big one. That was heartbreaking. But uh, last couple of minutes and to draw the match. But Stan Brennan uh, from Airog doesn't, doesn't allow me to forget that one. So it's a, it's a tough memory, actually, because... We had beaten them in the under-16 final two years before that, and it was much more or less the same teams. And we beat them in the league, and we beat them in the league part of the championship that year, and we, we were expecting to win the championship as well. We had a quite a strong team down in the middle. And um, Turlock O'Brien, I think it was Turlock O'Brien and Tommy Wogan were the managers for Air Ogan. They pulled a, a sly one with um, Eric McCormack, who would have been their, one of their main attackers. He actually tore his hamstring, say, the week of the final. And... Um, they kept it on the down low and they put Eric in the corner, corner forward. As the new one of our best players, Joe Roach, would be marking him as he always did. So we wasted Joe Roach in, standing in the corner flag for the whole county final while Eric McCormick couldn't even walk. So kudos to, to uh, Tommy Wogan and Turlock O'Brien there. That was a smart move. So how long did it take for your management to cop on? Was Joe moved out then? And if so, obviously it was pretty too late. It was, yeah, it was too little too late. I think he got moved out in the second half, but um, it was kind of too late at that stage. And yeah, I, I struggle to remember because my, my main memory of that is the missing the free at the end. Uh, I'll never forget it because it was quite an easy free. I I'd scored a couple of harder ones just before that. And um, I, knew, I wasn't out of pressure. I think I just took my eye off the ball. It was, it was such an easy free and I dropped a shot. But um, that's my main memory of the match, really. And I, I can't remember, actually, when it was into the second half before Joe Roach was moved anyway. And, and Joe was one of the best footballers in the county at the time. So, so yeah, we got, we got caught in by Airog. It was a managerial masterclass in many ways. You can see why they were involved with Carlo for so long. The 06 final then, that was the people's final in many ways. Yourselves and Pal. Pal had obviously lost the 2002 final to Rafili as well. So it was great to see in the final together. Yeah, I remember the build-up to the game and it was, as you said, a novel pairing because Airog and the Blues and uh, O'Loughlin had been, and Raffili had been so strong. And um, both Pat and Kildavin were always kind of knocking on the door. But this, this time, this year, it was going, one of them teams were going to actually win it. One of the bridesmaids were actually going to win the senior championship. But um, I remember our build-up. We, we beat Doc Hughes was actually our manager at the time. And um, George Coleman, Aidan Kelly and Christy O'Neill were the selectors then. So we had a... <laughs> A Barmy Army in behind us, I know, but um, we, we actually beat a very good Fenna team in the quarterfinal. Fenna were a top notch um, senior football team at, at that time with the Walshes, Stephen O'Brien, uh, Val Fleming, John Hickey, um, sure, uh, two more of them lads. Like, they were very, very strong. Scally Nolan, the twin, the twin Nolans, like, you know, they're fierce, strong all over the field. So beating, beating Fenna at the time was massive. Um, then we went into Air Oak. Airog were very strong. I suppose we, we probably weren't expected to beat Airog, but I always enjoyed playing Airog because they were all out football, attacking football, you know, and it was, it was always a, a very entertaining game whenever you play Airog anyway. Whether you won or lost, it was all football, 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 and they're very honest, honest old footballers in, in Airog. But um, to beat them that day was massive for us. I, I remember a picture of Di Byrne jumping in the air on the Nationals, and he must have been... 10 foot, his feet must have been 10 foot off the air. I'd never seen him jump as high trying to even catch a kick out like so. Just showed how much it meant to our, our community at the time. Like we were, we were moving quite well at the time. And um, well, I think 
there, there was no major egos or anything like that in, in our club at, at that time. And um, we kept ourselves fairly grounded. We, we knew we were facing a fairly formidable side in Pal, and we never, we never beat Pal too handy, or Pal never beat us too handy. It was always a point here or there, a draw. And they had some very strong footballers. The Reed brothers always come to mind. Uh, Skjok, Brian Farrell, Joe Byrne. Fierce, strong team, you know. So we knew it wasn't going to be a handy one, anyway. But um, I still think we, we left that one behind us. And I, I know Pal have won all our, our have won senior clubs since. Well deserved. Uh, I just think that year, um, I, I don't think I'll ever forget that one as regards, even if we had won one championship, you'd be kind of happy enough to re- retire if you'd won one. But we've never got that elusive medal now and it's it'll I'll never forget that like yeah I can only imagine like it's it's horrendous to, to lose any sort of a final but I mean there's probably no consolation in this Brian Farrell of course kicked the winner at the end but you did have your opportunities nonetheless we missed two very very kind of simple enough goal chances I remember about 10 minutes before that we really should have had the game out of sight and I think Pal would have maybe started fighting with each other and that would have been the end of that then you know but uh, we missed those two. We hit the ball the post and barely put one wide. And, um, and that would have killed them off. And we didn't take our chance. And then I think they got two 45s in the last couple of minutes. Brian Farrell kicked over two. And it was just a disaster of a way to lose the game then when, when we were on top for most of the game, you know. Yeah, pity that it just didn't work out, I suppose, on the day. Fast forward 14 years later, I suppose, and, you know, you're now intermediate and you're trying to make the breakthrough. And like all intermediate clubs, it's not easy to get back up there. I suppose we thought we might come up a little bit quicker, but we're finding that the intermediate grade is very, very competitive. Like, and um, every year so far that we've been drawn for the championship, you're going, we'd be lucky to get out of that group, you know, to get into a semi final or to get near to a final. You'd be just lucky to, to avoid relegation in, in intermediate the way it's gone at the moment. So, all, all eight teams, like, literally, if it goes ahead this year, any of the teams could win that championship again. So, very, very competitive. And, um, we seen there last year, we, we were going quite well and we had a couple of tough games in the semi-finals against Michel and came up against the Blues team on fire then. Okay, so Paul, this brings us to the curveball part of the series where I ask each guest to pick the best 15 that they have played with. The curveball being they have to include themselves. It can come from club, county, schools, wherever you play with them basically. So in likeness, who have you gone with? So number one, goalkeeper has to be... Clarky, uh, James Clark of O'Loughton, formerly of Tullow. Um, sure, anyone in the county, that, anyone that has been to a GA game in the last 10 years will know who, who Clarky is. He, he must be nearly 50 at this stage, but he's still, I think he's still talking out on the goal for O'Loughton. Um, so, lovely person and uh, he, he absolutely fantastic goalkeeper. Lovely person. I, rem- I remember when I joined the county team in 2003 and he's one of the first people to really make you feel welcome and he was a legend at the time so and he and I just remember him um, before games he used to have to go training and to matches he used to have to arrive maybe an hour before everybody else because he used to wear must have been was it eight or nine pairs of socks he used to wear <laughs> under his under his football boots I'm not sure I think it was eight or nine <laughs> so so that's our that's our clacky you know <laughs> I don't know, it was like a plaster of Paris on his football. <laughs> uh, he, 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 he was a great character, whatever, a, great, whatever, a great person as well. Whatever it was, it worked anyway. So, full back line. <laughs> full back line. So, Joe Roach, cornerback. He would have been one of the first lads on that team anyway. Um, I played with Joe the whole way up from when we were five, six years of age. Uh, best man marker I've ever come across. But also a fantastic footballer as well. Um, absolutely rapid, fast, great tackler. Good footballer, good passer. So he, Joe Roach had everything. So that's cornerback. Um, I have another Caledon lad now. We, we had a very strong defence, actually, back in the early 90s. And uh, I have another fullback. The fullback lad is Caledon as well. It's Liam Murphy. Um, Liam, Liam was, still is a fantastic fullback. He, he has the longest arms I've ever seen on a, on a footballer. He's, uh, they, they call him the caveman down Caledon because his knuckles will be rubbing off the ground when he's walking. But... Um, <laughs> Seriously good footballer as well, and he often came out the field with ball. And he wasn't just a big, tall man; he was a great, a great tackler. But he was also very good at coming out with the ball, you know. So him just over Brian Farrell of Hall, who is another legend. Um, the other corner back then is Cormac McCarthy. So Cormac, not your typical Aerog townie. So Cormac was tough as nails, 
a hard man, but I, I found out later that he was, he's more of a Fena man than an Air Og man anyway, so you can see where the owl, that bit of a bother comes out in him. Half back line, um, so I had Joe Byrne. I had Joe Byrne there until you told me I have to put myself in on the team. So the curveball, I wouldn't have myself on this other than the curveball. But, so Joe Byrne would have been there, but I'll throw myself in there right half back then, okay? Right, fair enough. You can apologize to Joe yourself. <laughs> I won't do it in person anyway. He's, Joe's a big man, an in, in, intimidating man. Um, so at centre back then has to be John Hayden. There was no real humming and hawing about that one. I think, I think John has been between the noughties and the 2010s all the way up along. John has probably been nearly footballer of the year on many occasions with Ole Lofton and with the county. So absolute fantastic footballer, great reader of the game. Brilliant on the ball and great organiser of defence. So it has to be John Hayden. And the last of the half back line then is Mark Nolan. So Mark is the same age as myself. Again, played with him since we were five, six years of age. Mark, tough as nails. Some man for a big hit. But again, brilliant on the ball. Fantastic footballer. Great vision. A great passer of the ball. Centre field, that's a, yeah, that, that was really hard. There's a couple of big names missed out on that one now, but sure. Uh, I went with Thomas Walsh anyway for the first one. So Thomas Walsh could possibly be the best footballer Wicklow ever had. Uh, big game player, as we were saying before. Great fielder of the ball. Um, uh, great man to run with the ball through the defence. And he seemed to be able to hop a ball about 20 yards as well. He made great, great gains on when he hopped the ball. Uh, so Thomas was fantastic, yeah. Straight in there. My number nine then is Dahi Byrne. Another club man, Dahi Byrne. So Dahi, Dahi was on and off the county team there for years with Thomas Walsh. Um, again, fantastic fielder of the ball. Huge club man. Dahi would die for the club, you know, and he's managed us there a couple of years ago there in the intermediate and fantastic manager as well. I think he's going to make a, a, a very good trainer and manager of teams in, in the years to come. But in his day, great footballer. Going into the forwards then, this, this, picking six forwards was tough. There's some unbelievable footballers that time in Carlo, especially. Um, so, Brian Carberry, number 10. So, absolute rocket of a man. Unbelievable pace and strength. And I don't think he needed that much skill. He had skill, but he was just such a straightforward go, run into the space like a rocket and go at defenders. Very, very hard to handle. I hated Mark and Brian Carberry. Um, one, of, one of the main lads, him and Mark Carpenter were the two lads that hated Mark and the most. Very straightforward footballer, but very hard to stop. Um, number 11, centre forward then, is the best player I ever seen play in Carlo or with my club. It's Mick Nolan, Mick the Bunny. So he was just starting to finish up when I was, when I was breaking onto the senior team in Kildavan. And he played with Carlo a little bit, but he, he probably should have played a lot more. He, he Maybe whether he was available or with work or whatever it was, but Mick was the most gifted footballer I, I have ever played with or seen in the county. Absolute magician with left and right feet. You couldn't mark him. He never looked like he had to sprint. He never needed to run hard. He was always in the right place, great brain, could kick off left and right foot off the ground out of his hands. So he was the best footballer i ever seen in, in Carlo. And then to finish off, a fantastic unstoppable half forward line is Mark Carpenter. So, Mark, you could have put Mark anywhere in the, foot, in the six forward positions, but Mark is the cleverest footballer you'd ever come across. Um, great at grabbing your arm and pulling you down and making it look like he was fouled. Very skillful, very fast. Great with a dummy solo and also Mark, and he kicked some great scores for Cardo, including that pint against Offaly, that very important pint. Um, full forward line then. To, to, I, I feel terrible about leaving off, leaving off the likes of Simon Ray and Brian Kelly and all. Fantastic footballers. But uh, I threw Mark Brennan in number 13 and I'm bringing him out to, bringing him out to field. Just, just uh, Mark, as you've seen with Mark with all often out around the middle of the field using his basketball skills and his brain. Uh, he's hopping the ball between his legs and he even played, even won the county final with Horn Hamstring. But Mark was a huge presence. Uh, for Old Ockton and Carlo there for, the last, for 15 years. So I have to have him in the team. So I'm moving him out around the middle from number 13, okay? Big sacrifice. Um, exactly. But that's, that's how high we'd hold him in, uh, in our opinion. So number 14 is a cousin of mine, Aidan Kelly. 
So Aiden never really played for Carlo, but he should have. He the best target man I, I've ever played with anyway. So you kick in a ball anywhere at all, fairly close to him, even if he's behind his man. He makes the best runs, very, very strong, and he will win that ball no matter if it's 40, 60 in the other man's favour. Aiden will win that ball. So best tar- one of the good target man up there. So Aiden Kelly is the man for that. And the last the last man then, the last player, number 15, is a man I played in school with. Um, he wasn't, he's a Wexford man, Fern St. Aidan's man, uh, Tomas Hawkins. So Ducker Hawkins, we used to refer to him as. Um, Tom- Tomas was an absolutely unbelievable hurler, footballer, soccer player. He played with Newcastle uh, for a year and he got homesick, but um, he could have made it in the Premiership. But football-wise, he was just phenomenal. He was small in stature, but he could jump and he could kick off four feet again. Uh, most accurate player I've probably ever seen. Um, fastest. He, he never really came, he never really made a name for himself at senior level of expert or hurling or football, but I'm not sure what happened there. I haven't been talking to him for years, but he was at fantastic when he was 16, 17, 18 years of age. He was unstoppable. So that's the team. Interesting, interesting indeed, uh, especially sacrificing the forwards for a third midfielder. I understand your logic behind it because Carl had some great midfielders, but we also had some great forwards in around that period. But um, just before we finish up then, just a flavour of some of the best coaches that you've played under. Uh, top coaches then, I suppose. Well, sure, Aidan Kelly was probably the biggest influence I'd say we ever had because he, he trained our team from when we were 6, 7, 8, all the way up to senior level. He managed that minor under 21 level. And we won probably the, the most championships we've won would have been under his under his tutelage. So um, his his son Aiden was I was just talking I had him full forward on the team. So Owl Aiden Kelly was probably the, the biggest influence on my football career. And um, I don't think I ever missed a training or ever went on a holiday. You'd be afraid of your life that that man would turn up to your door and point the index finger at you, and you just cower behind. He's a he's a scary man when he wants to be, but. Uh, absolutely fantastic manager. Um, who else then? So we have Tommy Wogan actually trained us in, in Kildaven there for a couple of years. Uh, brilliant, brilliant character. The most honest man you'll ever come across. And um, if you couldn't point a big shift for Tommy Wogan, you, you're in the wrong game altogether. Like, he's, he's such an honest guy. Um, he tried to introduce the Aerog style to us, actually. The, 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 three, the three forwards, full forward line, all in a little nutshell and kind of exploding out to the corners. Um, and he got us to a county semi-final where O'Loughlin beat us. Uh, I think O'Loughlin went on and won the final after that year. Yeah, I'm not sure what year that was, but Tommy was a brilliant coach. Um, Liam Hayes, we went through Liam Hayes. I thought he was very good. And the last person then well, I'd mention would be Christy Maguire, probably the craziest man I've ever met. Uh, eyeballs hopping out of his head, uh, more enthusiastic. He trained in Latin for two years, and he was, it was a joy to train under him. You're afraid of your life of him that he'd hit you a box or something, but he was absolutely infectious, his enthusiasm for the game. So, Christian Maguire, another legend. Yeah, so there you have it, an interview with a difference. Uh, plenty of insight into what it was like off the pitch there as well, and thanks to Paul for his great honesty. Hope you enjoyed it. I chuckled from start to finish, I have to say. Um, thanks too to the Back in Line Clinic, who sponsored this one. They are, of course, located in Kildavan Clinical GA Club for all your injury and rehabilitation needs. Uh, we do it all, of course, next week. Please don't forget to subscribe on your platform of choice, be it Apple, Spotify, YouTube, etc., etc. It is free to subscribe once you have the platform. So until next time, take care.